Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal here. Uh, I wanted to record today a video about the technical logistical factors of backing up your video content. So there have been some really good videos on YouTube about how videographers and filmmakers can back up their uh, precious video content. And those are really great, but something I haven't seen covered in so much depth is the kind of technical factors of, well, how many backup copies should you have and where should those backup copies be in order for your video to be really, really well protected. So uh, my standing in this is that I've been really interested in backup for a number of years. I've been writing about backups for um, both my freelance clients. I've written about backups for Linux Magazine and Linux backups pretty extensively. So as a sort of backup enthusiast, um, I thought I would just give a few thoughts about where the best, what, the, what a good robust strategy for backing up your videos might look like. So let's jump straight into this uh, slideshow I've prepared. So the guiding principle for backups, and this doesn't, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about video backups or audio backups or backing up documents or backing up websites, because ultimately we're just talking about data. The unique quality of uh, video is that it's pretty heavy data wise. So if you're backing up a bunch of Word documents, uh, it's probably going to be a while before you get even into the gigabytes. Whereas if you are backing up the, mas the master files of your video projects or a bunch of B-roll, uh, you could very easily be generating something like a dozen gigs of data per day. So that's the kind of challenge and I'll get into just in a small bit uh, why the size of that data matters because in certain circumstances it does matter. In any event, the general rule for backups is the th what's called the three to one approach and what this means essentially is that um, it's a methodology for de-risking data protection now basically what that means is that you'll always want to have two backup copies and one of those backup copies should be located off-site the problem with having one backup copy and this is something that a lot of these uh, video tutorials say as well you know the way to back up your video is to just put it on an NAS, a network attached storage. And I think most serious videographers have an NAS or a media server. An NAS is just a specialized type of server for data storage. So the problem with that approach um, is that it's only one copy of your data. So if your office or your studio or whatever gets hit by a tornado or gets flooded or whatever, um, then you're going to be left without your original copies. Now, if you're a YouTuber and you're uploading your videos to YouTube, that technically, yes, it is sort of a copy because using YouTube Studio, you can download your own videos. But the problem there is that you're not going, you're going to be getting back the video files after YouTube's compression and they're going to have lost a substantial amount of quality. So you really want to have, when we're talking about backups, don't rely on stuff like YouTube's backup mechanism as part of your strategy. You want to be protecting your original full quality master mixes, let's say. So the three, two, one rule here, we're talking about having your original data. So if it's active data, you wanna have your data. So if you're working a video project, you want to have those raw clips and your project files and your overlays and whatever else you have, as well as video clips. And you're gonna to want to have that data backed up in two places. If you've wrapped up a video project, then the original data source, you can delete that file once it's properly backed up, but not no sooner than that happens. Uh, so I've given an example of how this could be done well and how this could be done poorly. So let's say uh, done correctly and let's start with the three copies of data, primary plus two backups. So if you have your master copy on your NAS and it's in cloud storage and you've got the originals, you're still working on them, then you fulfill the first part of the 321 rule. You've got three extant copies of your data, the data you're working on. The first, the on site backup on the NAS, and you've got it in the cloud, so you're good. Two different storage media. So basically, what this means is, you know, um, when we're thinking about backup protection, we don't want, we want to factor in all kinds of contingencies, whether those contingencies are electrical oversurges or just uh, disk failure. So you wouldn't want to have two backup copies, you could say, oh, well, I'm supposed to have two backups. So I'm just gonna put two backups on my computer. I'm gonna have them on different disks. Now, technically those would be different storage media. So let's say you have two hard drives on your computer and you're like, okay, I'm gonna back it up to my computer and I'm gonna back it up to another drive on my computer. 
Firstly, that's going to fail the offsite test because neither is neither of those are offsite. But secondly, uh, what happens if the computer gets fried and all the disks in it get get fried? So you want to diversify as much as possible. So done correctly, two two different storage media. Well, one's on the NAS, one's in the cloud. So it's sitting in a uh, Amazon or a Backblaze or even a Google Drive or Dropbox data center. So if your NAS is fried or the disk fails, and that's the good thing about NAS, you do have redundancy. Uh, so you're protected from disk failure to a large extent. But nevertheless, I don't know, the NAS can, uh, can just fail. So um, then you've got your two different storage. Finally, offsite. So again, as I mentioned, the purpose of an offsite backup is because uh, it does happen that uh, houses get flooded or um, you're not using an NES, you're just doing cold storage, and I'll talk about that later, and uh, the disk fails. Uh, so that your on-site backup is gone kaput. So uh, you wanna have an off-site so that any of these, in any of these instances, uh, that's not the only backup copy. So again, when we're talking about video, if you're uploading it to cloud platforms and those cloud platforms are compressing then you can't consider that part of your backup strategy because um, at best you're going to be able to liberate from those clouds if they allow a data liberation function. Don't take that for granted. But if they do, you're going to get a D. You're going to get a post compression video file. So that's why uh, when we're talking about this, this specifically backup for video projects, we want to be uh, making sure that we're backing up the full original copies. So here's uh, here's a worked out example of a uh, viable cloud backup workflow. Um, so I have here, let's say you have your editing workbench or your workstation and you're working on your video clips. Once you're finished, and let's just say for, for simplicity's sake, you don't wanna keep the raw footage, the raw clips. You've, if you wanna use them for stock, um, you've put them onto a stock folder on the NAS. If you wanna, for in other words, B-roll, and you've got the finished projects on another um, on another volume in your NAS. So anything else is, is done, the project's a wrap. So in that case, once you've got to that point, uh, we don't really require the primary data source, uh, but we're gonna have it firstly on the NAS. Now that's gonna be backup one uh, while the project's going on. Then we're going to want to put that up to an offsite backup. So in terms of how easy it is to actually achieve a 321 compliant uh, backup workflow, well, it's actually pretty easy. If you happen to own a Synology NAS, and a lot of people do because Synology is like the leading uh, brand of NASs, then Synology has a very, very good tool built into DSM called Cloud Sync, and you can create very, very simple uh, automations that will move volumes up to the cloud. So I could say, I'm gonna have a volume on my NAS called stock, and I'm gonna automatically sync everything that goes into the stock volume up to Backblaze. And you can even have it so that your stock goes to Backblaze and your finished projects go to Amazon S3 or Google Drive or Dropbox or any number. And this is totally automatic. Now the problem for folks like me is that if you unfortunately have a really bad home internet connection or you know there's just nothing better in your area, the only thing I can get is DSL in this part of Jerusalem, then this is a bit problematic because the Synology runs automatically the cloud sync in the background. That means if you're creating gigabytes of data per day and you've got a really slow upload speed, there's pretty much always going to be data uploading on your network. And if your bandwidth is limited, then that's going to be limiting your bandwidth kind of constantly. So you'll be trying to watch Netflix or just do regular internet usage or upload finished videos to YouTube and you'll find that the internet is painstakingly slow. So this workflow would be brilliant if you have a uh, great internet connection, you've got something like symmetrical fiber, and you don't need to worry about these petty concerns, then this is a really, really easy way to do it. Uh, buy yourself a Synology NAS. I'm not selling Synology, I happen to own one, um, but this would be a very, very simple data workflow. Set up your volumes on the NAS, copy your folders over to the NAS, and then uh, use Cloud Sync to set up automatic backup to the cloud. And you're gonna have to pay uh, for some Backblaze storage or, for, or, for, or storage in uh, S3. If you're doing this professionally, then it's just a business cost. Backblaze is really, really affordable, and it's a lot, this is gonna be a lot cheaper 
than trying to use something like Google Drive or Dropbox, which are not really intended for archival storage. If you're using AWS, uh, then use the Glacier class of storage on S3 because you're not expecting to have to use access this cloud storage at all. It's just a uh, safeguard against the on-site backup uh, being destructed. Now, what happens if you do have a sucky home internet connection like me? Well, uh, I can uh, tell you one option because this is what I actually have to do. So uh, firstly, you can get an NES, that's not a problem. Um, so you're doing your backup from your editing computer onto your NES. You can either just uh, manually upload, copy and paste, or uh, if you're a bit more sophisticated, you can set up a script pretty easily too. So you get your videos onto your NES. Then what happens regarding the offsite? So this is where it gets a little bit trickier. So um, you've got a couple of options. One is that um, if, again, talking about Synology, they have a program called Hyper Backup. And Hyper Backup is intended to back up the NAS, meaning not just a volume on the NAS, it's, supposed, it's intended for backing up the whole machine, the whole physical machine, whoops. Um, but you can also just use it to uh, back up parts of it. And the good thing about Hyper Backup is it's a um, incremental backup approach. So you're not gonna have to back up the whole volume every single time. In backup, you have full backups, differential backups, and incremental backups. Uh, and you don't wanna be doing a full backup if you can avoid it. So hyper backups are a really nice utility within the DSM, Synology DSM um, tool suite. And uh, so what you could do, the, the, the problem about hyper backup, let's say you have a four bay NES that's holding about three terabytes of video. Now, um, it's designed to mirror either the NAS or volumes onto one external media. Now you could probably find some way to connect the whole NAS into NAS2 into NAS1 and then bring over NAS2 to your friend's place. That's kind of a crazy, crazy thing to do. There's another uh, Synology tool there for um, buddying up with a friend uh, who also has a Synology NAS and you can move uh, you can sync across the internet, but again, if your internet is sucky, um, if your internet if your internet is not sucky, I think you're better off doing the cloud. If your internet is sucky, I think you're probably better off doing this. So I can't really see a use case when using that utility. I can't remember off the top of my head what it's called. Would make sense. So here's the sucky internet use case: is um, with the caveat in mind about hyper backups limitation. What you could do is hyper backup to a HDD, to a hard drive, and uh, keep that hard drive in your office or in a friend's house. And then every, you know, um, every month, every two weeks, every week if you wanted to, you just uh, do the hyper backup again, update the, uh, the offsite backup, and move that to your friend's house. That's called disk, rot disk rotation. So that would be the uh, the option there. Um, it's, it's, a little, it's obviously more inconvenient. Uh, the beauty of the cloud backup approach, A, it's modern, right? People are using the cloud for offsite storage now and not stuff like keeping disks in their car, or, well, don't do your car, in your friend's house or whatever, it's, it's, it's ugly. Uh, if you have internet, great, I advise doing this. If you don't have good internet, and I'm doing this because I know a lot of people are like me, they know how to do this, but they're like, well, great, but my upload speed is like two megabits per second. That's not gonna fly. So this is another option you can use. Uh, any backup approach is better than no backup approach in my book. So even though this is kind of cumbersome, you're gonna have to you know, upload hard drives and use enclosures repeatedly and go over and back to your friend's house, it's effort that if you know if video is your livelihood or just your passion, um, I think it's worth doing this once a month. Won't inconvenience most people too much. Constraints and, lim and limitations involved in this slow upload speeds. Uh, so this is my problem. The cloud backups become painstakingly slow, and on low grade residential connections can hamper bandwidth. So that's something uh, I experience is my upload. Um, my bandwidth is so bad that like when I'm uploading to YouTube. My download gets slow, uh, so if you've also got such bad internet, uh, this is a problem. So the solution is uh, use physical offsite disk replication. 
uh, when better internet becomes available, store in the cloud. So I'm waiting for the day fiber internet, uh, symmetrical internet and good bandwidth becomes available here, uh, in which case I will be very rapidly switching over to this strategy. Um, the second problem you could run into is you're just generating tons of data. You're, you're, you're a, I don't know, you're a video fiend and you're, and you're generating terabytes and petabytes and exabytes of video, in which case the cloud come beco could become uh, very, very expensive. So you have to do a uh, cost analysis uh, comparing the cost of cloud storage with the cost of uh, physical data storage. And if you do that, you might find that the physical data storage comes out substantially cheaper, um, especially if you're using tape. So LTO um, as a storage class is still more affordable than HDD hard drives. Uh, the caveat is that if you want to use tape, um, it's harder to find tape nowadays because it's still, it's a pretty obscure technology at this point in the consumer realm. And uh, tape LTO machines are also more expensive. So if you wanna just use HDD for physical storage, you can buy a hard drive enclosure for like 30 bucks. You can buy a hard drive in any computer store and you're good. If you wanna go down the LTO approach, you're gonna have to spend more upfront uh, on your uh, CapEx uh, capital expenditure to buy them to, to buy an LTO machine then you're gonna have to buy your tapes from a specialist supplier so it's a little bit more headache but it can be done final point here um, the differences between cold and NAS storage for your on-site backup so this is a video this is a picture I took yesterday I decided um, because I'm a data paranoid Android I want to keep my NAS for backing up the good quality stuff um, in other words, the projects I care about and the stuff I don't really care about preserving in the original resolution. I put this video in that category, B-roll in that category. It's like, you know, I don't want to lose it. I want to have, I want to cover myself, but if there's data rot, it's not the end of the world. So, um, cold storage would mean, um, just storing your data on a shelf. So let's say you want to put your B-roll onto a hard drive like I've done here and you just want to keep that in an in a anti-static bag ideally and sitting on your shelf that's cold storage the, the downgrades the problem with cold storage is that um, it's the data is susceptible to bit rot uh, unfortunately all um, to the best of my knowledge all storage currently is um, it, you also don't have RAID so on an NAS you have uh, if you've got multiple discs you have you're actually protected against disk failure the NAS can survive, uh, can survive disk failure. On the plus side, uh, if you're just keeping it on your shelf and periodically moving data onto it, um, it's disconnected from electricity, from power. So if you had some freak electricity surge that blew through all your protections in your house or in your studio, the cold storage uh, should survive that. The, there's a chance the NAS could be fried. On the plus side for NAS storage, it's kind of more professional, uh, I would say, as a generality. Um, it's always there on the network. So if you want to move stuff onto your cold storage, you need to plug it in. You need to, if you've got an enclosure, power that up. Uh, whereas the NAS is just live on the network. That's literally what it is. Network attached storage. You've got RAID. Um, I mean, it's really hardware that's optimized for data storage. I, I, I know my Synology NAS has some technologies for constantly checking the integrity of the disks. So, it, you know, it's a really, really, NASs are beautiful devices. This is what they excel in is, uh, you know, building a mini data center on your network. So uh, what I'm doing personally is a mixture of the two actually. For my primary on-site storage, I'm using uh, NAS. Um, for uh, the stuff I don't care about that I don't want taking up space on the NAS and throwing it onto some hard drives. And I'm trying to move stuff offsite in the best way possible to me. It would be great to do cloud backup. Uh, unfortunately, my internet sucks too much. So um, I'm doing the best I can basically. So I hope this video was useful if you're interested in uh, backup approaches for uh, larger data files like video files, even uh, AutoCAD projects and stuff like that. Uh, these are some ways you can use in order to protect and safeguard your hard created uh, creative data. Thank you guys for watching. If you'd like to get more videos from me, please subscribe to this YouTube channel.